You may recognize the individual in the image behind me as former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. And if you've ever visited the Egyptian wing at the Met, you might have noticed that he's standing in front of the Temple of Dendur. So now given those two pieces of information, you may be tempted to assume that Secretary Kerry is at the Met for the opening of a new exhibition. And he is. He's there because the exhibit, Assyria to Iberia, at the dawn of the classical age, was opening that night. But he was also there for something else. You see, mere hours after this photo was taken on September 22, 2014, the United States began a campaign of missile strikes against Islamic State, marking the official beginning of U.S. intervention in Syria. So Secretary Kerry's speech at the Met that night did not focus, as we might expect, on the contents of the new exhibit, but on the threats supposedly posed by ISIS to cultural heritage. He declared that ISIS threatened the heritage not only of the Syrian and the Iraqi people, but the heritage of all civilized people. And the civilized world had to take a stand. You may be familiar with the narrative that emerged surrounding ISIS, that they were responsible for the destruction of cultural heritage on a scale not seen since World War II, whether through ideologically motivated destruction or financially motivated looting. And while I'll mention that neither of those claims is actually supported by much compelling evidence, I'm less interested in their veracity than in why the US Secretary of State would choose a museum as the platform to introduce a US military campaign, and why he would invoke the protection of cultural heritage rather than, say, the protection of human lives as the rationale for that intervention. I would posit that there was nothing coincidental about Secretary Kerry's appearance at the Met that night. Of course, the United States was really entering Syria to prevent the installation of a regime that would be hostile to its political, economic, and security interests in the region. But serving its own self-interest doesn't have quite the same ring to it as heroically coming to the defense of the heritage of civilization, does it? Now, when I say that Secretary Kerry invoked the protection of cultural heritage, what does that mean? Cultural heritage refers both to tangible and material heritage in the form of monuments, artifacts, places, and museums, as well as ideological heritage in the form of the peoples, identities, and histories that those materials represent. It is a broad, flexible, and selective term that is used to designate anywhere from the local community level to the national level to the international level. Prevailing understandings of cultural heritage envision it as positively connoted, derived from a universalist model that was formulated by UNESCO in response to the looting and destruction of cultural objects and monuments during World War II. And this hegemonic notion of cultural heritage has been widely used to materialize narratives of nationhood and civilization by selecting specific elements of the past to conserve and present. In this understanding, cultural heritage consists of materials and intangible elements that are purportedly of high value to all people. And this is what that designation of cultural heritage actually looks like at the international level. And I remember the first time I saw this map, I was disappointed, but I can't say that I was surprised to see that you can't even see Europe underneath all of that world heritage but Africa seems to be suspiciously empty of culture that would be of high value to all people. So I think it's worth remembering here that what is considered worthy of designation as cultural heritage is always the result of a selection process that is never politically neutral. In this sense, cultural heritage is a resource in power which is implicated in privileging and elevating certain histories and peoples, and which can be used strategically by state leaders to facilitate aggression towards others outside of national borders, often to the detriment of human rights. And this intermingling of cultural heritage and human rights in the event of military conflict isn't new. In the wake of World War II, two major forms of international protection emerge, international human rights law and international cultural heritage law, all designed to protect human lives, preserve cultures, and regulate violence in the, in the event of military conflict. And the reason that cultural heritage laws emerge in tandem with human rights laws at precisely this historical moment is because people's sense of communal identity is defined in relation to a shared sense of culture and history. So in this sense, 
cultural heritage is a resource that is used to express concern for human rights, but it can also be an appropriation that alienates people and attempts to rewrite and control the past, often in service of dangerous and harmful policy agendas, as has occurred in modern armed conflicts in the Middle East. And I'm going to illustrate how this works by working through a few examples with you. Cultural heritage management and archaeology in Iraq are deeply inscribed into a network of power that relies on the violation of human rights. And this dynamic was evident during the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, when cultural heritage experts and archaeologists were recruited to make decisions about which sites, monuments, and structures landed on lists to be protected from war damage, and which were allowed to succumb to neglect or even demolition. So we have the collaboration of cultural heritage experts with the armies of countries that are active in foreign territories as invading and occupying forces. The people who were listing sites to be spared during the imminent aerial bombardment by the US Army were advising those about to begin not only cultural heritage destruction, but a campaign of violence against the Iraqi people on a huge scale. In this way, cultural heritage is recruited to lend credibility to the benevolent persona of the occupier and added touch to its projection of a humanitarian image. The invading forces can thus present themselves as a civilized and civilizing force, even as they commit acts that seem to be in contradiction with human rights. And this is an intrinsic part of the moral economy of violence that is produced by this unsettling intermingling of the cultural heritage and the military wherein sovereign violence is deemed morally sound and legitimate when it can be translated into discourses both of cultural heritage protection and human rights. The images you see behind me are from a National Geographic article, and they actually show more recent destruction by ISIS at Nineveh in Iraq. And there's no shortage of articles with similar images like this one from places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Wall Street Journal. But unless, like me, you get some of your news by checking the Twitters of local Yemeni newspapers, you probably haven't seen this image of the destruction of Al-Qahra Castle in Yemen by a Saudi airstrike. In stark contrast to Syria and Iraq, very little attention has been given to the destruction of cultural heritage sites in Yemen as a result of the conflict between the Saudi-led coalition, until very recently backed by the United States, and the Houthi rebels. And this discrepancy in the amount of concern for the protection of cultural heritage sites or for condemning those who are implicated in their destruction, again highlights that it matters what kinds of histories are being destroyed and by whom. Syria and Iraq have a large number of ancient remains familiarized in biblical and classical texts and architectural forms. In other words, they are remains that can be envisioned as part of a Western civilizational past. Yemen's antiquities, however, fit much less comfortably within those Western paths, which honestly makes it easier for Europeans and North Americans to ignore them. And in Yemen, Saudi airstrikes are both the main culprit in the destruction of cultural heritage and the primary threat to human lives. But as I mentioned earlier, Saudi Arabia is a key ally of the United States, so there's very little incentive to call attention to their role in perpetuating the destruction of cultural heritage. To put it quite simply, it would not be politically strategic to invoke the protection of cultural heritage in this context. But if the destruction of cultural heritage in Yemen has been <coughs> largely ignored because the reality of the violence doesn't fit neatly within a convenient dichotomy of good guys and bad guys, then designations of cultural heritage in Syria have been summoned to paint a portrait of the antagonists and protagonists of the narrative in broad strokes. Just as the United States has used concern for human rights to justify its military action, so too has it used concern for Syria's antiquities to galvanize support for its intervention in the war. Now, prior to 2014, news articles that focused on threats to Syria's cultural heritage largely ignored ISIS, just as other aspects of their violence were ignored, even though they were already damaging sites and destroying monuments. And this all changes in 2014 at the precise moment of US intervention, when we see an explosion of discourse surrounding ISIS's role in perpetuating the destruction of cultural heritage, while the threats posed by other groups are now downplayed. And this timely 
shift in the conversation has the very useful effect of casting the United States as a savior, obscuring the troubling and messy ethical concerns regarding its military policies. Okay. So now that we can see the relationship between cultural heritage, human rights, and military conflict with a little bit more nuance and clarity, what are the implications? These observations demonstrate that the inherently imperialist dimension of discourses of cultural heritage management and the preservation of archaeological sites is not merely an issue of cultural control. Of course, it is true that due to its articulation of hegemonic narratives about the history of the Middle East, the archaeology has been a major conduit in the establishment and legitimization of the cultural dominance of the West over the Oriental other. Scholars have long recognized that notions such as the cradle of civilization are the products of colonial discourses that lie at the root of practices of political oppression and dispossession. But I would argue that the power of these discourses, while pervasive and insistent, lies not in their cultural imaginary alone, but in their connection to political, economic, and military forms of control. So as we consider the role of cultural heritage destruction and preservation in situations of armed conflict, we should not be thinking of human rights and cultural heritage as two discrete spheres, but rather as overlapping discourses of politics, laws, and histories that can have profound effects on how we frame and understand military conflict producing real and tangible consequences in the form of policies that may threaten human lives. So the next time you see a news article about the destruction of a cultural heritage site in a place where the United States or another world power is militarily active, and that shouldn't be too hard to find, right? <laughs> I hope that you pause for a moment to consider what other policies, agendas, and violences might be lurking beneath the surface of that headline. Thank you.